So welcome everybody. Um, this is Code for South Florida's um, open data in support of COVID-19 relief conversation. Um, we're brought today with some local IT directors and leaders at the city and county level, as well as with GitHub. And I'm really excited to kind of just talk about some of the things that we're doing here in Miami around this work. So for those who don't know, uh, the, the purpose of this conversation is to talk about how do you respond uh, to a pandemic leveraging open data. Um, we've brought today with a few speakers, Jose Lopez, who is the ITD Division Director at Miami-Dade County, Raimundo Rodolfo, for, uh, the Director of IT and CIO at City of Coral Gables, Eric Johnson, Solution Engineer at GitHub, and Michael Sarasti, CIO and Director of Innovation and Technology at the City of Miami. Um, this conversation is to kind of capture stories, just highlighting how these CIOs and directors across public and private and community sectors are working together to leverage open data or even open source to tackle COVID-19 to better serve their people and their constituents in their area. And we'll also be sharing a little bit and learning a little bit about how GitHub is leveraging um, and working with uh, state and local government around this particular topic. So just a little quick, like, Backstory. So DataGov is an initiative that was started through Microsoft Philanthropies here in Miami um, around this idea with these founding partners, City of Miami, City of Coral Gables, and Miami-Dade County to talk about how we can kind of eliminate the silos between city and kind of county government and work together around data sharing and more initiatives that can help drive smart city initiatives, as well as just drive an overall better understanding of data government topics. Code for South Florida, which is a nonprofit in this area, is focused on digital transformation. And the big purpose of our goal is to understand how we can help smart cities um, to and through and government through civic engagement and digital transformation. Some of the things that we're going to be talking about here today is we're going to be doing and, and asking the CIOs how they're looking at approaching leveraging open data and open source initiatives. Um, we're going to be doing um, a brief presentation by each of them. Um, that will last about five minutes around the work that they're doing. And then we'll kind of pass it on to GitHub to talk about some of the work that they're doing with state and local government. And then towards the end, we're going to open it up to uh, the attendees to ask questions to some of the speakers here. And then we'll close out. So let me start by kind of like backtracking and giving the floor to all the speakers today to ask them. Um, how are you guys approaching leveraging open data or open source during this pandemic? Let me stop sharing my screen to open up the floor to each of the speakers. And anybody can start, but let's see, uh, Ramundo, do you want to kind of start off here with the question, how are you approaching leveraging open source and open data towards this pandemic through City of Coral Gables? Yeah, sure, Gregory. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Well, data is insight, is actionable information, and it has been critical for decision makers, for policy makers, for city officials, first responders during the pandemic. So it has been key for us to leverage anything that we already had before in terms of data and analytics, all the data and information assets that we already had before the pandemic. But also we had to develop additional cap capabilities, and we have to respond very agile to provide data when they needed and that meant working late hours and weekends and nights but we were able to produce a lot of uh, insight and data that helped to track uh, the cases to track the performance and operations during the pandemic and we got a lot of help and collaborations with organizations like yours and also from universities from FIU and from UM and from NIST GCTC. Thanks, Rudolfo. Uh, Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about how the city of Miami is looking at open data and open source during this time? Yeah, I, I want to echo uh, a little bit of what my friend Raimundo said. Um, you know, we've, been, we've been doing a number of open data related work for some time, very slowly, I think, you know, sort of setting an example, telling people this is important, a lot of evangelism and advocacy. Um, very similar to, to the, the situation we were in with digital service delivery and, and letting people know that you know we want to have a mobile first online mindset rather than people coming into the building. Um, all of that with COVID went very quickly from you know 
advocacy to do it by Monday. Um, so uh, the the demand wasn't just coming from you know us sort of creating demand for this thing and telling people it was important. The, the need for it became really obvious very quickly. So I think that's the you know we'll call that a good problem of all the problems that we have now. That's one of the good problems to have the the, the level that the demand is actually coming from uh, from the business. You know we've got uh, leaders at all levels that are are requiring more data more often and digging a little deeper and that's opened the door for um, you know us not being the only actually in this case we are not the main providers of the open data at this point I would say we are now beneficiaries of open data coming from the state uh, beneficiaries of open data being freed up by our partners so I think because we've had a, a good solid handle on what open data is for some time now, some of us in the department have been at, at least thinking about this for you know a good you know decade, if not almost that much. Um, and um, you know the, the the real use cases have finally arrived. So we've been a, we've 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 been able to act as a really solid uh, bridge to help connect and you know talking about things like data standards and formats and um, Jen, my team, she's our senior data fellow. I'm actually going to um, hand the, the mic over here to her for a quick second because uh, she's really been at the forefront, both as explaining what this is and also the recipient of open data coming from different directions. And I'll, I'll qualify that like in this case, because things are moving so quickly, it's not necessarily open data um you know that is like we're putting it in our open data portal and it's available api sort of checks off all the the real boxes a lot of times these are just csvs moving around through the organization so some of that is is um is are, are just data sets that are kind of moving around uh and uh us kind of looking forward to the you know the end game which is all right now everybody knows that it's important to share some data uh it's also now important not just to share it with each other but to share it with the public so, um, Jen, I'm not sure Gregory wants us to open up the slide deck just yet, um, but so maybe just talk a little bit about what you. I'll, I'll let I'll let Gregory okay. direct us on when it's time for slides, or if he just wants some general uh, chat right now. Yeah, just a general um, insights on your your thoughts here, Jen, and then we'll get into slides in the in the next. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just like as Mike uh, mentioned. It's been actually um, exciting to see all the partners wanting to work with us and reaching out to us because ultimately uh, this pandemic has brought us all together at the city of Miami and it's made us realize how important it is for us to work together. And as opposed to keep information from each other for whatever reason, we've realized that we need to share uh, data and by sharing that data, we can make data-driven decisions, everything from the, our city leaders to down to businesses. So we want to make sure that that we are uh, making it all we can and that we're actually making an impact in the community and helping in whichever way we can. So it's been great to have, um, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, but we've had a lot of community partners reach out to us and work with us on this matter. Thank you, Jen and Mike from City of Miami. Um, Jose, if you're on the line, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on this from Miami-Dade County on how you as a leader and what you've seen kind of like your work, you're leveraging opening data or open source during the pandemic. Uh, hi there, this is Jose Rodriguez. Jose Lopez is not available today. Uh, okay, so uh, we in the county, we are a big uh, like provider of data for open data. As you know, we have an open data site that is based on our GIS platform, and there we have more than 500 data sets for many things. And that is publicly available for not only for municipalities, but for every citizen in the county. And we are constantly updating that data sets that we have there. And we are we have plans to add more data related to COVID-19 efforts that the county is doing right now with the search and the CEP initiative from the office of the mayor. Uh, we are doing the final uh, tunes to the data that we are preparing um, to be part of our open data platform to be shared with everybody. That's where we are right now. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, and while Eric is on the line, I'd love some of your thoughts from GitHub on interesting ways um, you're seeing CIOs and leaders approach leveraging open data and open source during the pandemic. Oh my goodness. Well, hi everybody. Thanks, Gregory. Um, a lot to share on this. I, I think what what I really want to share in, in depth here are a couple of things. One, some stories of how the state of California addresses the process around sort of data and sharing and just getting public information out. Um, and I'll do that in uh, you know in just a second. There's another piece of that though. I mean, GitHub of course is the the largest um, site for open source code and open source data in the world. And there's just been a ton of work uh, on that, you know, going on. I'm just doing a little quick look here. There's 71 repositories of uh, on the sort of COVID topic here out there that have collaboration um, around the world. Um, but, I, but I think uh, we're seeing this with local partners like Miami, Miami-Dade, Coral Gables. We're seeing this at the state level. Uh, and, and obviously what we're seeing are, are sort of speed, sharing, uh, both of those at the forefront of, uh, of effectiveness in COVID response. But more details about that in a sec. Thanks, appreciate it, Eric. So now we're gonna shift it over from question one to question two, which is not really a question, but more of a sit down and listening to how some of the cities as well as the county are approaching um, their work. I'm gonna leave, give the floor to Ramundo um, of City of Coral Gables to kind of share his pitch deck of what he's working on. Thank you, Gregory. I will share my screen now. And you let me know if you see it, please. Yep, we see it. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, well, I'm Raymond Rodolfo again, uh, CIO and IT Director with City of Coral Gables. I'm gonna go really quick over some of our uses of data and data insight and analytics during the pandemic. So in this busy screen you see there to the left, uh, that's a screenshot of our hyperlocal data hub. It's a homegrown application where we aggregated um, data sources specific to COVID-19. We have to provide this very in a very agile manner uh, to provide insight to our uh, emergency operations management team, to our EOC, to our city manager and our city official. And that aggregates a lot of external data also, data that you may be very familiar with during COVID-19, like data from jo John Hopkins University, data from uh, ESRI and GIS hub uh, aggregators, and also data from the county and from FEMA and the CDC. So we aggregated a lot of data. Not every time we had the APIs to connect everything like we like to do with horizontal integration in our smart city hub, but we wanted to produce quick results. And that's what you see there. So we had to develop portals to connect directly to hospitals. We already had some capabilities from our electronic um, patient care system that we already connected to hospitals, but we didn't have a way to gather the data in real time. So we had to develop those data interfaces and allow the hospitals to send us the data as they were generating that. So that's a way to get hyper-local data from the source directly from the local source, from the local hospitals. Now we are collaborating with the University of Miami to uh, um, get that data also into their portals so they can aggregate more data from uh, local sources. To the right, you see something that we did to, uh, to um, gauge the status to gauge the uh, the issues and the challenges that our local businesses were facing so the, our local businesses they were heavily in, impacted by the pandemic like everybody else but they especially small and medium businesses uh, highly impacted so we wanted to gauge uh, data and insight from the businesses directly so we put out a lot of electronic service through our smart city hub and citizen engagement tools and working with the economic development department we got a lot of data from businesses directly we tabulated that data, we generated those dashboards that you see there, and we used that data uh, as a, a initial way to produce a series of content, like webinars, addressing the issues that they had, and we brought experts and people to help the businesses with internships, with free resources, with uh, e-commerce tools, etc. So this was a way to gather data before. And let me go really quick back here to mention a list of our partners that we are collaborating on data. Uh, I am one of the co-chairs of the NIST GCTC data supercluster. So I work on a lot of data initiatives with the NIST GCTC and with partners from uh, countrywide cities, counties, and also 
uh, Science and Academia. And uh, University of Miami Institute of Data Science and Computing, we are close partners and we are collaborating now with them, piloting the um, experimental situational awareness tool that they developed for COVID-19. We are also collaborating with FIU, with the engineering school on some data analysis also for IoT and that you will see in a, in a moment. And of course, collaborating with all the partners in this uh, webinar and in industry partners. And this is a paper that I submitted to IEEE where I analyzed uh, data coming from cyber physical systems and from IoT, from all our traffic sensors, environmental sensors, air quality, water quality sensors, uh, noise sensor, and also uh, vehicle counters, pedestrian counters, RF behavioral sensors. So when we aggregated all the data and analyzed it, we found those interesting curves that you see to the to the right, where you see how um, traffic and the environmental variables evolved and changed during different phases of the pandemic from the uh, closing to reopening to different phases that we have uh, faced uh, uh, after the after the beginning of this crisis. So this data has been very insightful and now we are doing a second analysis where I'm going to get help also from post postdoc uh, researchers at FIU School of Engineering to do more analysis and now get that data that we analyzed initially and correlated with social variables as well and economic variables. And then here, lastly, so you see uh, to the left, you see our smart city engineering framework and how uh, different layers of high-speed communications, uh, CPS, Internet of Things, uh, hybrid and distributed clouds, data analytics, machine learning, and artificial intelligence use cases and horizontal integration allow for us to aggregate the data in the Smart City Hub, where we make sense of the data, we provide insights to first responders, to emergency managers, and to the, to the right, you see our use of artificial intelligence and machine learning for analysis of public sentiment. So gathering data from the citizens and from businesses and from stakeholders and analyzing public sentiment around issues, around policies. So that's very insightful for decision makers and for uh, officials. To the bottom uh, right, you see uh, our horizontal integration systems engineering model, which is key for us to aggregate all the data and visualize it in geospatial analytic platforms like GIS and on, on the city's smart city hub. If you want to see more about this data in real time, we have it on the Smart City Hub, coragables.com slash smart city. And that's it in a nutshell, very, very quick, Gregory. <laughs> and sorry, I couldn't cover too much details, but that's in a nutshell what we're doing in terms of open data during the pandemic. Thank you. I'm always very impressed by the level of work you guys are doing at the City of Coral Gables. And I think this is just, um, one of the good models, I think, when you think about like, how do you leverage data and how do you get all of these channels together? Um, so thank you for that, um, Ramundo. Um, I would like to, to give the floor next to City of Miami, Jen. We'd love to hear some of the work that you guys are doing. So Jen, you're pulling up the slide. There. Cool. Yeah, there, there. <laughs> cool, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick off with a couple quick things and then turn it over to Jen who's doing again the, the heavy lifting on this stuff. Um, uh, always the same, just to echo Gregory, your uh, compliments of what Raymundo's doing. Always do a fantastic job in the Gables of bringing all of this stuff together. I, I you know, we're using some of the same stuff that, uh, you know, obviously I'm sure the county's using and that Raymundo's using that's coming from Johns Hopkins and from the, um, you know, the various Esri tools that we share. So I, I wanted to talk, uh, a little bit about something that might be a little different than the city's doing. Uh, this is a uh, some samples from the COVID situational data reports that we are getting at the city um, right now occurring Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. This full disclosure is us at the city benefiting from uh, open data being compiled in other places. So I think what we've done um, that I'm actually really impressed with our mayor in in kind of taking taking the the concept of being data driven to heart is he's really engaged a number of city managers. We've got representation there from City of Miami Beach, City of Coral Gables is there uh, quite a bit on another a number of the uh, other mayors, and has assembled a group of experts from the local county health department, from FIU's epidemiology team, 
And they, uh, in this collaborative environment with all these experts, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, get together every morning for a situational report on where we are with cases. The cool part about this is it's not just taking the the case data that is coming from, um, you know, whether it's the, again, most of that comes from the state through the health department, but applying an extra layer of analysis on that open data. And uh, these are just some examples where there are a number of smoothing models that are running on top of the daily case data to provide a more accurate picture. Um, as you know, and if you've been following, this data kind of jumps up and down all over the places. So sometimes, you know, you'll go from, you'll have data dumps that'll give you, you know, because you've got a big round of testing. So you'll see maybe a, a case count jump up to a certain number. Uh, the team of epidemiologist teams have been taking that and applying some, some really great analysis um, and uh, posting it on GitHub actually. So uh, the link is at the bottom. If you want to take a look at that link, it is publicly available. Uh, everything that is built on that site um, is actually uh, uh, coming from open data, a number of open data sources, primarily uh, the data coming from the state. So uh, you'll see things here, you know, the positive uh, test by day, but then they can do some deeper smoothing on the case data over a two week period. You can get a lot more granular and hopefully more surgical about whether you're doing a shutdown or are you shutting down certain things or is your mask order working uh, better? Go to the next one, Jen. Yeah, so here's another round and also doing a, a little bit more sophisticated analysis on like what the last two weeks look like are the trend on the proportion of positive cases you know the the goal has always been to bring us down to about five percent is has been the, the generally shared target around this um you know we've been in the we've been in the 20s um over the last you know um, few weeks and, and months i think at this point um but that has finally started to shift down and you'll see on that left hand chart a downward uh trend still tough to see if that's continue the whys are always a little bit unclear if that's happening but um, while cases continue to go up um we have started to notice a flattening of the rate at which they are going up um which is a a good sign so the the case count at some point was growing exponentially and it's now no longer growing exponentially um and again that's the kind of stuff that we would not have had um just by looking at a you know a chart coming directly from the either the Johns Hopkins or the state dashboard. Um, it really required the, 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 the pulling down of that open data and, and putting some putting it in front of experts so that they can give us deeper analysis. And the, what I'm particularly proud of is, you know, some somehow this messaging about data driven government has uh, both, you know, resonated over time. But uh, as I mentioned before, COVID has sort of pushed it to the forefront. Um, I'm actually really proud of our our mayor. I, I don't often send him you know, side complimentary notes, but I did on this and I, I, he has been digging into a really deep extent and, and driving uh, the evolution of, of some of these models. So um, with that, this is happening. If you click on that link, I just realized I changed the font to white to make it a little bit clearer. We can put it in the, I'll, I'll put it in the chat while Jen is talking, I think, uh, and then maybe if everyone doesn't see that, uh, Gregory, you can share it out to the, the group at large. Um, this is the data day uh, COVID situational data. What Jen is going to speak to, we have a whole other group that is specifically focused on recovery and what happens um, once we're we're all coming out of this thing. So I'll, I'm going to turn it over to her to talk about uh, that. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Mike. So uh, one of the really cool things that we've been doing now at the city is that we're working with different partners and. Um, What's been nice is that all these partners, community partners, are reaching out to us and saying, hey, we have this data, uh, we want to share it with you, we want to make sure that we're making conscious decisions. And we have a whole other um, area of this, which is the economic recovery. So we're preparing weekly reports to the city manager. And in here you guys can see an example, um, we've been leveraging some Power BI. And essentially what you can see in this particular chart is that you see how um, pre-COVID, so you have like right before um, you know, March 14th, March 10th, around that time, you can see uh, in this particular case, it's Miami Parking Authority data. So it's on, on street parking. So you can see how um, you had like a higher volume, a higher revenue. And as um, time goes on, you can see that big drop, particularly right after uh, COVID was um, the city declared a state of emergency. And then you can see how there's a trend that uh, 
revenue just dropped tremendously. And slowly but surely seems to somewhat be picking up, but then it continues to go back down. And then you can see here that there's a, um, like a difference between uh, for the 4th of July weekend, which um, that's when we saw, we experienced a rise in cases. And then uh, the one right under, it's actually a, a pretty neat chart as well, because you can see how different areas within the city of Miami um, have been impacted also as a result of um, COVID. And for this bottom chart here, we particularly have information starting on May 20th. So May 20th is when we implemented um, our economic uh, reopening plan. And uh, you can see how as time continues to uh, pass, we have certain areas that uh, some are picking up better than others. Um, so this has been a very, uh, very insightful for us to also understand what, what the residents are, are currently doing, where um, you can see that areas such as Brickle, our uh, business area continues to have, or for now, is the one that has a higher um, daily revenue. But then we have areas such as Wynwood, which had been historically strong areas, have uh, dropped and have been picked up as well, that well. And then um, another partnership that we have is with the um, Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau. And it's also been uh, very interesting from that end. Uh, the city of Miami, we depend on tourism. Like we, the part of our um, economy depends on that. And if you look at it, you can see how um, our hotel demand and our hotel supply has actually, um, particularly the demand, how it's dropped. And we've actually gone into negative numbers compared to previous years. So then here you can see the actual economic, part of the big economic impact uh, that we've experienced in the city as a result of COVID. And right under um, a chart that I always find pretty interesting is the one of um, passenger information, like domestic flights and international flights. You can see the tremendous drop from uh, February of total passengers all the way to March and then April. I mean, it's a significant drop and we're definitely um, feeling the, the, the effects of it. Um, but we've continued, uh, you know, we, we, we provide this to the city manager and a group of um, community leaders so that they can sit down and, and kind of understand and we can explore our possibilities and how we can improve and how we can help businesses uh, in a better way. And we also have other partnerships um, that are pretty interesting. Like we've been working with the Miami Downtown Development Authority. We've been working with the Coconut Grove BID. They've been conducting business surveys, which we've also conducted internally. And we're aggregating that information so that we can have better reports and have a better understanding on how some of these particular businesses are being impacted. And uh, we're also looking forward to um, a partnership with MasterCard in which they'll be able to um, provide us with uh, transactional information. So that way we'll be able to understand as well which industries within our city of Miami are being impacted more than others. And ultimately all this information, all this data, we can aggregate and create a better um, report and better understand on the economic side of it, how things are, um, how things are developing in our city. Hey, and uh, just this one's actually for uh, for Eric real quick. I, I did match the background color to our slide deck <laughs> uh, since you were asking if I could change some colors just to make sure. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Awesome. You're welcome. But I'll share the link now in the chat. Cool. If you haven't. <laughs> Thanks, Jen, and City of Miami. I mean, like kind of Mike touched on, I think the mayor was one of the first, I think, in the country to kind of go forward with like testing positive for COVID-19. Um, and then kind of like, it's just amazing to see how on the ground your team has been, Mike, as well as Jen, on kind of like making sure that we get some of these data initiatives up and that we're tracking it. So thank you guys for like sharing a little about your work. So I, I, we have Jose Rodriguez is on the line and I know Jose Lopez couldn't make it. Um, so Jose, do you, do you, did you have a deck prepared or do you want me to just go into the next kind of like phase of this? No, unfortunately I have nothing prepared. Okay, Sorry no problem. That. No problem, no problem. So I actually have a deck prepared just in case um, something like this were to come up to talk a little about code for South Florida and some of the work that we're doing. Um, can everybody see my screen? 
Yeah, yes, looks yeah. great. Yes, yes, sir. Awesome. Okay, so I'll take some time right now in five minutes to talk about local air and some of the work we're doing with the city of Miami as well as with Miami-Dade County around uh, air monitoring and um, local low-cost sensors. So for those that don't know, Code for South is a nonprofit organization. Um, we focus primarily with partnering with government and nonprofits to do what we call modernize how government serves the people in the digital age. We do this through kind of strengthening that understanding of how do you deliver public services that are kind of human-centered. Um, a couple of months back, we explored this idea of air quality and poor air quality is one of the largest public health uh, kind of threats and nine out of 10 people breathe air containing high level of pollutants from World Health Organization. And more recently, since COVID-19 has come, there's been a lot of talk about like air pollution and air monitoring. Um, as you know, many people are wearing masks and we're in a time where people care a lot about who is next to them and what they're breathing. And um, some research from the Harvard University, Aaron Bernstein points to the fact that the evidence is clear that places that kind of like have um, high air pollution are areas where people are more likely to die from the coronavirus. Through that work, what we explored is this idea of communities needing just kind of basic access to information around data for air pollution that can kind of affect change. So some of the topics City of Miami and Coral Gables have presented is sharing and demonstrating data and then working with the right partners so they can understand it and make actionable decisions. And we thought about that as, okay, what can we do to help with this? Um, one of the things we looked at is PM 2.5, which stands for particulate matter. And we, we noticed is higher concentrations of this um, based on data from MedRx and their report show to an 8% increase in the COVID-19 death rate. Um, through some of this work, we've also looked at other different um, data points related to air pollution, such as uh, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, uh, nitrogen dioxide, and ozone. And as we dive deeper into that work, what we looked at and found is that for every small increment in air pollution, there's this increase in the likelihood of death, um, particularly through COVID-19. And you could pick any city in the world and expect to see air pollution kind of being um, kind of connected to that. And this is research again from Harvard University, Arid um, Bernstein. So that brings me to the topic of local air. For us, we partnered with Microsoft Research to get these low cost sensors deployed with the help of City of Miami and Miami-Dade County to metro um, rail locations, such as in Overtown, um, the Government Center, Brickell, um, by the City of Miami's Fire Station 5, which has an EPA um, section there, to help with this idea of how do we help Miami um, get more access to open air quality data and how do we make sure that the city and the county can kind of leverage this data to help with whatever initiative they're working on? So local air uses Azure IoT and transforms data from these low cost sensors to inform cities and their residents about air pollution in public spaces. So our whole idea is we believe we need more open data and civic engagement on climate change and smart cities can help. So this is a small sample uh, photo of the sensors. Uh, we deployed 10 most recently, and through Microsoft Research, I, I got a little time to install and set up and look at it. Um, these sensors are actually pretty powerful. They measure a couple of things such as carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, oxygen, ozone, particulate matter, as well as temperature and humidity. And in real time, we're kind of, or nearly real time, we're getting data from these sensors every 20 to 20 minutes to about 40 minutes and it's being sent through Microsoft Power BI and it's giving us readings on all of those different data points. And through some of our work, what we've, I, we've kind of isolated as a use case is kind of this idea of public health and particularly public health and air pollution as it impacts ethical uh, minorities. So African-Americans and Hispanic, which in the areas that the sensors are, are predominantly the, 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 the demographic that we see there. Um, City of Miami is very diverse and we have a lot of different people. So how do we leverage data or get data so we can bring it to the right people so they can understand how air pollution is impacting these communities? And some of our most recent work, we've kind of worked together with OpenAQ, which is an international um, nonprofit working on open sourcing and getting more open data around air quality with governments from in about 93 countries and the US EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, um, to share our model through uh, Open Opportunity Project Sprint, 
or working closely with what we call user advocates. These are specialists on air pollution and the topic of leveraging sensors and data to see how we can leverage some of this work and create like a localized model that can be replicated across other cities that may be interested in deploying sensors. Some of the goals for this include what we call closing the air quality participation gap, which is getting more people involved with understanding air pollution um, and air quality data and getting them to kind of test and give us feedback on ways that we can make this data easy for them to understand, especially as it connects to COVID-19. So I'm going to now switch off um, and talk to Eric about some of the work that he sees at GitHub at the state and local level. GitHub is the largest provider of open source and kind of open data, and they're the platform if you're a developer in any form um, where you can kind of collaborate with other people. So Eric, I want to kind of pass the floor to you to talk about what you're seeing and some of the work that you guys are doing. Well, thanks. I appreciate it, um, Gregory. That's, uh, that's The sensors look really, really cool. Mike, I'm thrilled to see uh, you know GitHub Pages being used to host some of your data uh, from uh, from that standpoint. Let me uh, let me just pop up I, a couple slides. I, what I really want to talk I want to talk kind of about two stories. Story of COVID, of course, and a, a little bit about GitHub and kind of what we're seeing. But but I really want to tell you a story here about the state of California. Um, obviously, a, a, as a very large state. A lot of folks, they have concerns that are a little bit different than some of what Miami and Coral Gables and, Dade, and Miami Dade are seeing, but not necessarily so different. Um, and uh, I think as we look at what we've seen and get up at how the state of California here has responded and really how IT ha has been able to help with that response, um, I, I think you'll uh, you'll find some stuff here that could be uh, could be useful here as a, as a takeaway, and some stuff really that jives with some of what you all are are uh, already doing. So very uh, very quickly here, there's sort of five things here uh, that we want to talk about. Okay, speed, scale, process, continuity, and collaboration, and how this is poking up in California, and how this might this kind of stuff might also come up here in your municipalities. Um, but let's start out uh, first off with the players who we're talking about. The, the, our big protagonist here is state of California, in particular CDT. This is California's Department of Technology. They, this is their sort of centralized IT operation. Um, CDT is large, I mean, 200,000 employees. Um, it is not sort of everything doing IT for the state, but, but they're sort of there as kind of the, the, the vanguard, if you will, the, the, the kind of research kind of on the forefront uh, of how the state implements IT. Okay. Um, and they've been called in uh, to in a variety of roles with the current uh, COVID response here uh, that we'll see. Um, and, and of course, the other side of the story, uh, really not the hero at all, not even a sidekick here, but sort of the enabler for some of this stuff, of course, is GitHub. Um, and, and I mentioned earlier that we're the home of a bunch of open source projects. A lot of the, the kind of software that's used to generate some of those charts that we just saw uh, you know, NumPy or Anaconda or that kind of stuff, those projects, that software itself, a lot of that is open source produced by the community and that development takes place on GitHub. Um, but we're not just for open source, uh, you know, we've got about 50 million uh, users on github.com. A lot of those are doing open source work, but this is also sort of private industry, governments uh, and so forth. Um, you can see quite a few logos there, municipalities and in, uh, in states here that we're working with. Um, if you're using GitHub, you may choose to make your code public uh, where it can be used by open source, but the vast majority of, of enterprises that are using GitHub choose to keep their code private, but use GitHub as a, a way to speed up collaboration here, um, as we'll see. Okay, principle number one, speed. So in the state of California, statewide, a lot of expertise, whether it's air quality, emergency response, COVID information, whatever, getting important information out to the public is priority one. And for CDT, who is sort of uh, the job there to backstop other specific agencies, speed is critical. Oftentimes a website is a key way to communicate with the public. You got an emergency going on, they don't have 30 days to sort of get those efforts spun up. 
Um, and again, CDT are in the front lines, not a response, but of response and, and being able to disseminate information here that's been so, so important. Um, we'll see here through a variety of sort of system changes that, that we'll talk about in, in a couple of these other principles. Um, CDT has been able to reduce the launch of a new project, new web-based project here. A couple of years ago, it would take them 18 months to figure it out. By the time they sort of went to the data center and provisioned the right servers and plugged them in, got the internet and got the software installed and so forth, through a lot of automation and other stuff here that we'll see in, in a second, CDT currently can deploy brand new, scalable, ready to roll on proven infrastructure, largely on cloud here, it takes them about three hours. And in this sort of this journey, as they refined all their tool set and their approach and their tactics here over that, you know, last year and a half, they went through a number of iterations of sort of how, how they do that. Um, GitHub uh, in a variety of, uh, of guises here have sort of been a piece of it. I'll focus on the, the most recent, the, the most fast here. Okay. Um, so speed, critically, critically important. And I'll say that that's the speed of sort of whether it's response time. So, hey, when somebody's on the phone getting emergency information, do, does the website load quickly? That's key. But also it's speed to deployment, speed to be able to say, we have a COVID-19 situation. Folks in the state are demanding information here. The web is how they're gonna get that information. How quickly can we get brand new COVID-19 specific website information backed by statistics, numerical data. How quickly can we get that spun up? Um, scale, of course, is important too. And in, in California, the kind of trial run for this COVID stuff from CDT's perspective, not from human cost and all this other stuff, but from, from the IT perspective here, um, was last fall's fire season. Um, there was a, there's a situation in California, last fall's uh, fire season in Northern California and Southern California was particularly bad. Um, uh, part of what happens during fire seasons is the utility shuts off power in sort of large areas of the state, really as a preventative, because power lines through uh, rural areas are, are key, uh, tend to spark fires. So pg e the utility here, was doing rolling blackouts in a number of areas. Um, and uh, they would quite helpfully notify folks that it was happening in your neighborhood or whatever. They were not helpfully able to keep their website up. Uh, so you've got citizens of California, customers of PG&E, who are going to have their power cut for a period of time, unable to know what's going on. Um, and the key to some of these techniques here that CDT pioneered at that time were both speed and really scale. pg &E had a fine website. The problem was, is under fire style load, it could not uh, hold up at all, okay? And again, think about that first primal, like let's add servers to that, you know, let, let's have CDT take that on and throw more servers in the data center and do that. That's fine if they happen to have that spare capacity, but again, took too, too long. Process. You got to automate, right? Uh, if you're looking here to, to support scaling and very, very quickly, um, you've got to be able to automate what that is. Um, California and, Cal and, and California's IT has significant security uh, requirements. Um, the only way to be able to respond in, in, in a speed fashion here is not to like skirt the security requirements. You can't do that, shouldn't do that. There's no reason to do that. Instead, you've got to automate the process. And that's whether it's deployment, whether it's testing, uh, and whether it's security scanning so that uh, CDT, the folks who are producing content for the website, the data, whatever, developers on that side have confidence here that what's going to be produced here is, uh, is, is secure and high quality. Um, and again, the, the key here is really automating all of that. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in California's case, they use a couple of tools, GitHub and GitHub Actions for continuous integration. Uh, they also use uh, Microsoft product uh, Azure DevOps, um, largely because that tool had uh, a footprint uh, in the state prior to all of this. They didn't reinvent any wheel, they sort of built on what they knew. Um, uh, and, and, and both uh, GitHub and Azure DevOps play very, very well together. Okay, continuity. Here's the part where we really get into uh, to COVID specific, okay. Um, work from home, uh, there were a lot of folks at CDT who had to be on the job 
for business continuity reasons. There were an awful lot of folks in the world of COVID who didn't have to be on the job, who in theory could work from home if they could deploy from home. Um, and again, in this case, this is where sort of cloud comes in, whether it is the version of GitHub that, that is the cloud, github.com, but with the enterprise stuff on top is called GitHub Enterprise Cloud. Uh, that's what CDT is using now for, uh, for the majority uh, uh, of what they deploy, but also then being able to deploy to the cloud. So getting out uh, uh, in, in many, many cases of uh, having to have physical infrastructure in a data center, which requires somebody to be there if there's a change or requires significant VPN or other sort of network workarounds to get into it. Um, again, working with the cloud makes all of this far, far easier here from the work from home world we're facing here in, uh, in COVID. Right. Um, now I will say that's, that's sort of what California is seeing. Um, I, I mentioned GitHub having 50 million developers that, uh, that use it. Um, we see uh, you know, kind of a lot of data around the activity of those 50 million developers, um, particularly in the world of open source, right? So what projects are popular, who's contributing, this sort of thing. Um, and, and if you're sort of interested how COVID has sort of changed the world of development, how work from home has changed that large picture, um, we published uh, in early May a, a little bit of an update. So once a year, uh, GitHub publishes statistics about activity. You know, it's popular languages, um, very, very high level kind of what kind of activity do we see across the platform with these 15 million uh, developers. Um, we took a look here uh, at activity first three months of 2020 compared to 2019, right? So three months of lockdown fairly globally. Um, and, and if you're interested, I highly recommend, you know, kind of clicking through. This is GitHub blog, GitHub.blog. You can find this post. Um, but I will summarize just a couple of things. So one is uh, developers globally kept working. Generally speaking, interaction here, uh, activity on GitHub, about the same or increased in some areas. Use of issues to track bugs and that kind of thing increased uh, over that three months compared to your, uh, a year uh, prior. Um, Interestingly, uh, work days for developers seem to get longer, about an hour longer. Um, if you've got folks on your staff, uh, we might think about what that means for burnout. It's hard to take a vacation. Where are you going to go if you're going to take a vacation? Um, those are very, very real, real concern. Um, and then the other thing that I'll say here is, again, on GitHub, that contribution to open source repositories here is up. Takes, uh, it takes less time for a pull request, a code change uh, to get review uh, and generally uh, an increased amount of sharing. And, and that's really uh, an echo. This is a kind of a global echo of what you all were saying around sharing data, sharing statistics, publishing dashboards, Mike, like you guys have on GitHub pages. Again, we're seeing this uh, kind of globally. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll kind of lean in here to my, the last of the five points here in the world of California and CDT, by implementing GitHub and the, the sort of workflow and processes that, that came out of the world of open source, that came out of, that were a play from code that, that is shared, that is public. But, but to be clear, most of what CDT does on GitHub is not public at all, but their teams maintain the same kind of sharing workflow, even though it's internal. And so, with this change in tooling over the last 18 months, they've seen an improved set of partnerships internally with other departments, with industry as well. Um, and that has really sort of culminated in the world of COVID for California and CDT in, in deciding to take some of that work that they've done and, and, and sharing it more broadly and open sourcing it. Um, this is a little GitHub uh, page here for CalCat. Uh, it is uh, uh, a, a COVID assessment tool, essentially, uh, which the state has shared. It is free for anybody to use. Um, and you'll notice in this case, um, th this makes the tool available. The stat that I can see, I'm not sure how widely uh, that it's being used by other states. I've got to follow up with that with the California folks. Um, but I will say at this point that, that there are 80 folks who have duplicated this code, either for their own purposes or to study it or to make suggestions. Um, in pulling this screenshot just yesterday, we have three open contributions or pull requests from the community at large. So 
it's being used and folks are contributing to this code because it has been shared, shared on GitHub and made open source. Um, and, and I guess this is really, I think the key point here in, in the California story. They didn't set out, I mean, open source is great as far as the state's concerned. There's a little bit of a mandate in California, but it's kind of a weak one. CDT didn't sort of set out to be an open source pioneer or really worked it this way. CDT set out to be able to, to respond faster in the wake of the crises, starting with last year's fires and fire season, needed to respond to provide public data. Those skills, the sort of developer skills, tooling skills, approval skills, security operation skills that California then practiced through all of this has been able to serve them very, very well in the current mission at the current time with COVID to be able to respond, to be able to provide public data that they need. Um, and, and I gotta say, this is so, th this work of open sourcing is something, this is the governor of California. Um, they are very, very excited about it statewide. Uh, it's not often uh, that you see your governor hopping on TV to talk about a project that has gotten open source. There's a ton of pride here in the state uh, with, with the work here that's been done. Um, the thing that I will say is sort of more sort of our, to our point and sort of more generally, um, this is just one example of COVID-19 related projects, some data, some modeling and so forth here that are available and released on GitHub um, and uh, can share a link to here again another blog post that sort of summarizes some of that uh, here from uh, you know from earlier this spring. Uh, there's also sort of a dashboard of COVID related resources here that uh, that that's uh, that's available more widely. So again, speed scale process, continuity, collaboration, uh, and if you want to talk about any of this, uh, Tanner Hogan or myself here on the GitHub State and Local team would be pleased to uh, to talk further with you. Gregory, thank you. Michael, why are you guys, Mike, why are you guys hosting uh, your uh, that data on GitHub pages? So I, I can't take too much credit for that. We, that's our uh, epidemiology team's uh, choice, and they're doing a bunch of open source stuff over there too, so they're, uh, they're in the mindset. I can say that uh, having come from the, the county, uh, I think my old team, they're still is a GitHub shop, um, but we made that transition for a number of reasons. So um, we may be doing something similar here at the city. It's just a function of time and training. So, yep, indeed, indeed. indeed. Well, and it all is related one to another. I mean, people and process is a huge, huge part of this. Yeah. So I want to open the floor up to any of our attendees um, to ask a question if they have any. And if not, I will reach out with a question that we have on our end um, to both GitHub and to